Chapter 4 Dementia When I got back to the game, I was getting very upset and confused. I thought about the way the monster looked at me. This game, the game couldn't have heard what I said. That's impossible. It had to be a random occurrence, but why did it happen precisely at the moment I insulted the monster? Nothing about this game made any sense. The new Godzilla monsters, the weird replacement monsters, out of the place imagery like the green temples, quiz levels, and the red monster chases, it, it didn't seem to add up in any meaningful way. If it was a prank, it wasn't funny in any way that I could understand, and they clearly put far too much effort in it, into it. If, if they were trying to make a genuine sequel with new Godzilla monsters, then, then why did they add everything else? Maybe it was some kind of art experiment, some group project made by a bunch of really talented and crazy people and they somehow lost the cartridge somehow. Or maybe they intended for some random person to find it. Hmm. It, it was all just fruitless guessing. As far as I could tell, there was only one way to figure out what the deal was with this game. To play it through to the end. Maybe, just maybe, there was something... There would be something in those credits, an explanation by the creators as to why they made this, or it could be something much more cryptic or strange, maybe even something horrifying. Before I got a good look at the dimension, Dementia board, I considered replaying Trance to see if the red monster would look at me again, but I decided against it. I wanted to keep moving forward. I was also somewhat worried that backtracking might cause the game to become even more strange. The dementia board music sounded a lot like the Saturn music, except it was slowed down and played with a piano sounding instrument. Like most of these new maps, it had a dangerous, sus suspenseful feel. Um, while listening to the music, I looked at the dementia board. There were four new boss, mo boss monsters this time. Or there were four boss monsters this time. Space Godzilla, Manda... Gigan and Baragon. I was surprised that there were two new Toho monsters this time, but the best surprise was still to come. I started the quiz level. Here's another list of results in the same format as the last one. Quiz two, question one, can you swim? Answer, yes. Reaction, happy. Question two, do you like fish? Answer, yes. Reaction, sick. Question three, can plant penguins fly? Answer, no. Reaction, sad. Question four, 
Can it spin in all directions? There was no clarification of what face meant by it, so I just guessed. Answer, no. Reaction, surprised. Question five, do you breathe oxygen? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number eight. Question six. Does it taste good when you bite a woman? I don't know who came up with this question, but I really hope they're getting mental help. Answer, no. Reaction, annoyed. Is it question seven? Is it night where you are? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number six. Question eight. Do you like cats? Answer, yes. Reaction, confused. Question nine. Is water wet? Answer, yes. Reaction, angry. Question 10. Have you ever broken a bone? Answer, no. Reaction, happy. Question 11. Do you like your job? Answer, yes. Reaction, hurt. Question 12. Would you like a new monster? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face 11. I wasn't entirely sure at the time what face meant by new monster, but I couldn't resist answering yes, just to see what would happen. The result was mind-blowing. The game took me back to the board, and I had a new playable monster in the form of Angiris. Ever since I was a kid, I, I always wanted to play Angiris, since he was my second favorite Godzilla monster, and plus I never liked Mothra all that much. I moved my new Angiris piece over to the left right next to it, eager to test out my new monster. Before I get into the level description, I'll talk about Angiris a bit. Usually, using the up and down buttons, you could choose whether Angiris stood in a bipedal stance or, in a cr or crawled on all fours. It wasn't a huge difference, but being able to stand was helpful in boss fights, and crawling sometimes helped dodge obstacles and attacks. He could punch and kick like Godzilla, but no tail whip. Instead, he had something far more interesting. The ability to curl in up into a spiked ball of death and roll forward. You could still take damage, but it was lessened. It was a good way of clearing out stage enemies, but unfortunately, doing this also drained the power bar. But the spike ball wasn't his only special ability. When you press start, he would fire a beam of energy from his mouth. It resembled Titanosaurus's sonar attack. And if this were a hack, it may have been inspired by the roar attack from Atari's Godzilla fighting game uh, series. Also of note is that when playing Godzilla, the level meter glitched up. Uh, judging by the life and power bar, I'd say he's on level 10. Now on to the level. As you might have guessed from the level icon, these levels are green palette swaps of the ground and background titles from the Blue Mountains. But what immediately caught my attention was the water, which had a transparency effect. Was, was that even possible for an NES game? I know the Super Nintendo could do it, but I had never seen a transparency effect in a game on the NES. The Green Mountain music was played with the same instrumental 
as the Blue Mountains, but the melody was totally different. It was a very simple song with a lot of abrupt pauses, followed by a loud noise, a loud note every few seconds. Anyway, I went through the usual strolling through the level. And again, there were no monsters or anything. But pretty soon, I had reached a cliff above the water. There was nowhere to go but into the water, so down I went. The water transparency made things a bit harder to see. But it's tolerable. After going underwater, I encountered two new enemies. A giant piranha and some kind of spiky bottom feeder thing. I liked the piranha because it, I could easily tell what it was. It was the same enemy design that would appear in a real game. Um, and there were very few enemies like this. They didn't take much hits to kill, but they were quite annoying and considerably trim down and would cons considerably trim down your life if you let, if they got close enough. And they also tend to travel in packs. As for the bottom feeders, they're easy to deal with. They swim along the bottom of the screen towards you and are easily crushed with the roll attack or jumped over. In the screen cap, you can see me about to run one of them over and there's a pack of piranhas behind it. After I beat that level, I moved Godzilla onto the blue castle icon. I started, did the level, and I got a title screen with the text, Unforgiving Cold. The level itself looked like a castle dungeon made of blue bricks with rows of identical white statue faces on the walls. These statue faces had a permanent look of horror on their faces. There was also some gray, flickering gray static, which didn't really obscure my vision, but it adds to the very unsettling mood of these levels. The music was 12 second loop, of a low-pitched choir vocalizing. That sounded very familiar to me. Whenever I played through one of these levels, I got this, this sudden, horrible feeling of anxiety. I had the feeling that the farther I progressed through the level, the closer I was getting to something unspeakably evil. There weren't any enemies, but there was... These were some of the longest levels in the game. I only played one level, but it took seven minutes to complete. I didn't want to admit it to myself at the time, but I realized something playing the Blue Castle level. This game... This game has the power to make the player feel certain things. And I don't mean in the sense that you get irritated crap playing a crappy game or get unnerved by something scary in a game. What I mean is that certain events in this game can instantly make you start feeling something. I know that sounds completely insane. I, I don't blame you for not believing me. I wouldn't believe any of this either if I didn't play the game myself, but this is something very, there is something very, very wrong with this game, and I still don't know how to explain it. Then it was time to fight Baragon's replacement. Although Baragon was originally the smallest monster in the game, his replacement was the largest. It was so tall, in fact, that the ground 
was noticeably lowered and not Baragon's head was still barely avoided collision with the bar at the top of the screen. And it was frighteningly bizarre as he was huge. You may be wondering how he attacks without arms. Well, he has the most powerful kick in the game, but his other fighting technique is much stranger. First, he blasts a cloudy breath of pixels at you, which cause you to freeze. Then he walks back to the right corner of the screen and extends a huge Gatling gun from his abdomen. Th this might seem amusing to you, but it certainly wasn't to me when I was playing the game. This attack is almost as annoying as Gagan saw, and not Baragon could have been unbeatable if he consistently used that. Thankfully, he only did it twice while fighting him. Once you unfreeze, you can run up and start take, damaging the gun, which does extra damage to him. This helped me to destroy him. And then it was time to play the third level. And I decided that I was going to use Anguirus and fight Manda and Gaga and fight Space Godzilla with Godzilla. It was only fitting. Before getting into the battles, I'll describe a third level type. The Arctic. The Arctic is exactly what you'd guess from the name. An icy tundra with few watery segments. The music reminded me a bit of Northern Hemispheres from Donkey Kong Country in 8-bit form. A very dangerous sounding song. It made me think of being trapped in the tundra and freezing to death. There were two new enemies in this stage. The first was a creature, frozen, and a block of ice. They block your way, and so you have to use your heat beam to thaw them out of the ice. They look a bit like a smaller version of not Gizera, only without the eye. When freed, they do a strange calling movement and push you backwards. It doesn't cause any damage, but it is a bit annoying. After dealing with the ice man, I kept walking for a minute or two and came upon a water segment. I jumped in and after, and this time I managed to get a screen cap of how the water splashes when you jump in it. Don't know how they program that, but it's pretty impressive. Another interesting thing is how the screen changes focus when you go underwater. Here, you can see the other new enemy, a little thing I like to call Spike Walker. They walk towards you and explode randomly or instantly if you attack them, sending spikes in every direction. These spikes don't do that much damage, but they did get me dangerously close to falling in a pit a few times. Oh, speaking of the pits down in the water, the game has a platformer element. Bottomless pits. There weren't any of these in the original game, and it was strictly, since it was strictly an action game game, but the pits were a neat addition. After getting back on land, I encountered a very unexpected mini-boss. Maguma, the walrus kaiju. I know this game has some obscure monsters to begin with but wow not that i'm complaining it's pretty cool to it's a pretty cool camo you know from an underappreciated kaiju maguma's fighting tactics were very simple he had a freeze beam and he could charge at you not very challenging but certainly more entertaining than the matango mini 
he was in the original game. One really interesting thing is that about Maguma is that he doesn't die when you defeat him. He turns tail and retreats. This was the first time I'd ever seen it, an enemy monster change direction, let alone retreat. I tried to chase after him, but he disappeared after I got into the water. Poor bastard. And that does it for the Arctic. Um, I'll talk about the Manda fight next. I forgot to mention before, but the music that played during the new monster fights is reused from themes actually in the game. So far, the themes have been as follows. Titanosaurus, Gizra's music. Bioanti, Hedera's music. Orga, Baragon, Magero's music. Mando, Varan's music. Space Godzilla, Mecha Godzilla's music. As for the fight, Mando was a fairly crafty opponent. When he realized his one tactic was ineffective, he would immediately change to another one. Manda had quite a few tricks, like spitting fire, biting, and most irritating, the most irritating of all, constricting. It doesn't mercilessly drain your life like Gigan's cutter, but it was by far Manda's strongest attack. One last thing to note that I found pretty cool was that the Etric Gon showed up during the fight to help me out. Manda crushed you with ease, but it was still cool. After I slayed Manda, I played through the Arctic level for health power ups, and then I was on to Gigan's replacement. When the fight started, I was very confused because. There was nothing there. I, I thought this was going to be a, the Titanosaurus fight on Pathos, but then just about that time, it would have been going back to the map, a piranha appeared on screen. But it wasn't there for long. As soon as it appeared, the speakers emitted an ear splitting screech and not Gigan flew in and ripped the poor fish to pieces. Well, that's one way to get the player on their toes. That abrupt entrance scared the hell out of me, and I got my, it got my adrenaline rushing, which in retrospect was a good thing, because not Gigan was one of the fastest, most unrelenting opponents in the game. Not Gigan was tough, but my new skills with Anguirus helped me score, even the score. It was still an incredibly intense fight. Not Gigan's attacks consisted of some kind of blood laser he spews from his mouth and a downward splash. Uh, slash. I was expecting some hellish variant of the buzzsaw attack, but, but thankfully there didn't seem to be one. The howl was invaluable in defeating him. I would have taken more screen caps of the fight, but it really it was really hard to concentrate. After that, there was just one monster left to take down. Space Godzilla. As mentioned earlier, I used Godzilla in their fight. Space Godzilla's fighting technique was rather frustrating, but admittedly a very clever idea. Space Godzilla would use his energy to create two flying crystals, which would reach the ground and become crystal spires. Now, these spires not only block you from reaching Space Godzilla, but it also allowed him to constantly recharge to full energy and blast you with a deadly charged corona beam until it broke the spires. Space Godzilla would eventually drain his own spires of energy until they shattered. And if you waited for that to happen, you'll probably lose a lot of life. Heat beams actually seem to re-energize the sprites, so you had to physical, use physical attacks. 
when you finally got close enough to hit Space Godzilla, he was no pushover. When I punched him, he hit me back just as hard. Space Godzilla does everything in his power to knock you back to the left corner of the screen so where he can so he can create more spikes. By the time this was over, I had only had five bars left, but it didn't matter because I didn't need to fight anyone. I needed to run. Here we go again. I decided that right then that I really wanted to see this, see the end of this game. As terrifying as these levels could be, I had to beat them to get through. I decided that no matter what happened, no matter what this game showed me, I was going to get to the end and also make sure not to say a damn word while playing a chase level from here on. For this chase, I tried out Anguirus since his roll attack allowed me to move faster than Godzilla and, or Mothra. The chase started off like the first two, except there was a river of blood below the ground. I was beginning to get the hang of it, and the extra speed from the roll helped me get an edge on the red monster, especially since I didn't have to worry about a power limit that you keep rolling. and could keep rolling endlessly. Like... The previous levels with water, the ground inevitably reached a stop, so I rolled off into the blood. To my surprise, the hell beast didn't follow me. It just stopped at the edge and grimaced. I guess I can't swim, I thought to myself. So I went under blood and continued moving. There wasn't anything else around, but I knew something. I knew something was up. The, the chase wasn't going to end that easily, could it? Surely something had to show up. And, and, and sure enough, I heard that bellowing roar sounding slightly different. And the monster was following me in a new aquatic body. I had no idea it was a shapeshifter. After it reappeared, the chase started to get into the difficulty I had expected. Being submerged slowed me down, putting me and the beast at about the same speed. The only thing that would have kept me alive was fast thinking and reflexes. I encountered some bottomless pits which in which mines are floated up from. I assumed that if you hit one, it would damage you and knock you back. Considering how fast the red monster swims, hitting the mines would be an instant death. So I went through great effort to avoid them. But it wasn't all I had to be wary of. Halfway through the chase, the hell beast revealed yet another surprise. A tentacle formed of intestine and tipped with a clawed set of jaws burst from its mouth, trying to pull me in and devour me. Yeah. I only barely avoided the tentacle and the mines, but I could tell the beast was getting desperate. But the chase was nearly over. And about a minute later, I had spotted a bit of ground that served as the exit. I leapt with all the might I could muster without breaking my controller. The beast screamed with rage and jumped out of the blood river in one last attempt to drag me down. But I escaped its grasp this time. I fell back on my bed and took a deep breath, satisfied with another successful escape. Now I was headed for the fifth world.
entropy.